Good afternoon, everyone. This proceeding is being live streamed on YouTube consistent with the open courts provision of the Texas Constitution. If any of the parties have an objection to the live stream, kindly bring up your objection to Judge Iserlo. With that being said, the 455th District Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Iserlo presiding. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Judge Iserlo here of the 455th Civil District Court. We are here in cause number, we are leave on the record, we're on cause number GN24-001696. This is a 2.6 assignment case, although this court is currently on the family docket, this since it's been especially assigned. Uh, we are uh, here with you on a civil case. We are here on a motion. I must admit, I've never seen a motion entitled this before. It is, uh, or heard of one in my, gosh, over 30 years of litigation, uh, prior to taking the bench, we're here on a cross motion to enforce the local rules. So who set this motion? Uh, Your Honor, I set this motion, uh, Matthew Zorn, for Defendants Heldritz, Symposia, Psychedelics Today. All right. Very good. Who else is who else is here on behalf of Defendants? Okay, who's here on behalf of Plaintiff? Uh, me, Your Honor. Uh, George Lake, George Greg Lake. Okay. All and right, Mr. Lake. Your Honor, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, Greg Noche and Liza Eoff for uh, the USANA Promega defendants. All right. So I'm trying to figure out, are you and Mr. Zorn, are there different defendants here, Mr. Zorn, that you're representing? And then we've got the USANA Promega defendants. There are there there are two different groups of defendants, Your Honor, and, and I'm happy to explain the, the difference in maybe giving the court a little bit of an orientation about the case before I explain the motion and the necessity for the motion in this case. Yeah, that might be helpful. I must say joint motion to enforce the local rule is a little unusual, as you all can imagine. So let me hear from Mr. Zorn. Yes, Your Honor. It's an unfortunate motion, um, and I think it would be helpful if I just orient the court a bit about what this case is about, and then I will get into the substance of the motion. Right. Um, and so in many respects, this is probably going to be a standard fair Texas citizens participation or, or TCPA case. Mm -hmm. um, from, from our viewpoint, this is a case about plaintiff's attempt to retaliate against all of the defendants for exercising free speech rights. And in particular, alerting to the public to a possible public health risk and frankly, fraud, Your Honor. Um, and, and there are some unusual facts to this case. Um, there are two groups of defendants in this case. So there are the USONA Promega defendants, and then there are the Republisher defendants. And I'll explain the difference in just a moment, but I'm here representing the Republisher defendants comprised of journalists, scientists, and social media personalities. Here's the gist of the case. The plaintiff, the Church of Sacred Synthesis, says it has a sacrament that has a molecule in it called psilomethoxin that it distributes to its members and that its members use religiously. The church not only makes this substance and distributes its sacrament to its members, but it also offers the sacrament for sale on it on a website in a marketplace, for example, at the sacred synthesis.com slash marketplace. You can buy a sacrament bundle for $145. You can buy 30 sacrament capsules for $100, or you can buy a chocolate bar that has some sacrament in it for $65. A couple weeks ago, the church had a Memorial Day sale where you could get sacrament for 15 or 20% off. Now, what this case is about is the USONA and Promega defendants obtained one sample of the so-called sacrament. They tested it, and they did not find any psilomethoxin in it. Instead, they found psilocybin which is the active constituent in magic mushrooms, which are controlled substances, Schedule One, under both federal and Texas law, which means they're illegal to possess, use, consume, and so forth. Then the USONA Promega defendants published an article on the testing that they did, explaining the results to the public. And I would just alert your honor, nobody that's tested the sacrament has, with any level of scientific rigor, has found any psilomethoxin in the sacrament at any point in time. And I, I need not belabor this point. Um, basically, in certain respects, by all credible proof, the church is selling magic mushrooms online. 
Now, in the case of the Promega USONA defendants, it studied the sample and published that result in a scientific journal online. Some of the other Promega USONA defendants, including Promega itself and its CEO, appear to have absolutely nothing to do with this case and were simply brought in by plaintiffs for reasons I cannot explain. In the case of my clients, the republishing defendants, they essentially wrote articles or commented on the USONA Promega. Uh, it's not even USONA Promega. It was just an article written by two of the defendants in that group. And so their acts range from basic journalism to opinion and criticism calling into question the church's practice. And so very shortly, Your Honor, the defendants will be filing a Texas Citizens Participation Act motion asking this court to dismiss the case because, among other glaring deficiencies in plaintiff's case, there's no credible evidence, let alone clear and specific evidence, to substantiate the existence of Silla Foxen in their sacrament. In fact, if you were to go to the Wikipedia page today, it would call that molecule hypothetical. Now, that intro is just to orient this court to some of the unusual facts of this case. And now I, I want to talk about the unusual motion that, that I brought to this court. Because over the past several months, it's become clear to uh, us that plaintiffs and their counsel have expressed an unwillingness to abide by unambiguous rules. And then when we bring that to uh, their attention, they concoct reasons ranging from unreasonable readings of the rules to no harm, no foul for why the rules don't apply to them. So the present motion has to do with pre-motion conferences. Plaintiffs didn't confer with defendants before filing the motion. And to be sure, I discussed with plaintiffs' counsel the subject of the motion, which was a motion for substituted service, because I told plaintiffs' counsel that we would agree to waive service days before they filed the motion. Um, and so there was resolution of the issue. And I said, just give me a couple days. I will get the papers in. Your Honor, I had two depositions in real, very large matters and had the affidavit right in front of me and I was ready to file it. And plaintiffs went ahead and filed their motion anyway, saying nothing of the fact that we agreed to waive service. Um, and then in subsequent correspondence, simply misrepresented what had happened between the parties. Um, and then in their response, the court can see that their interpretation of Rule 2.2 is that three motion conferences only need to happen after a hearing is set on a motion, which is completely contrary to the text of the rule, which says that all non-dispositive motions require a certification that the parties have conferred. And the reason why is fairly straightforward, which is to avoid having to bring needless motions to the court. And I, I should note, Your Honor, that plaintiff's motion was sort of the archetype of a needless motion because, again, we agreed to waive service, so there was no need for substituted service. Now, that 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 isn't the only reason why we have brought that to the court because this is not proving to be an isolated incident. Um, in fact, there are more serious violations of rules that we have put in our reply brief that I think it's important for the court to know. Um, one of them is plaintiffs insist in their response that my clients weren't officially represented. That's a phrase in the response by me, even though I expressly told their counsel orally and in writing that I represented them, two, two of the defendants. Knowing that my clients were represented by me, plaintiffs counsel contacted my clients directly without copying me on the correspondence. Plaintiff's counsel knew they were represented by me because I told him that, and they went behind my back and talked to my clients in an email. More concerning, um, in an effect, it, it is, as part of what appears to be a fact-gathering operation to complete service, plaintiff's counsel impersonated a fake individual and contacted the USONA, one of the USONA defendants, USONA, and, and this is beyond dispute, Your Honor, because there's a recorded voicemail of plaintiff's counsel purporting to be a person named G um, contacting them to, uh, I, I don't even, it, to donate money to them. It's, it's, but this was one day after plaintiff sent a demand letter to USONA, plaintiff's counsel calls impersonating an individual named G and then also sends a written communication or plaintiff's counsel purports to be a Roger Growing, 
um, and then sends contact information with an email that plaintiff's counsel plaintiff's counsel's email. And that's that's in our reply brief. It's in a footnote. Um, and then when we confronted plaintiff's counsel with, frankly, these unimpeachable facts, plaintiff's counsel floated conspiracy theories like his phone number, phone being hacked, and then simply stated he never misidentified himself, uh, even though it's pretty clear that he did. Um, and finally, there's there's now a motion on the docket for a protective order. Um, plaintiffs seek discovery of a third party uh, to get information on, on my anonymous client who offered criticism anonymously and <laughs> wants nothing to do with this case or plaintiff's enterprise. I have no idea why He's he's a social media, a small scale social media personality, and he doesn't want to be publicly associated with this case. And most importantly, I told plaintiffs we'd be willing to waive service if we could maintain his anonymity through the opening of discovery. And plaintiffs refused. So I I, I have strong suspicion <laughs> that plaintiffs have included him for improper purposes in this case. Um, suffice to say. Um, uh, plaintiffs aren't entitled to discovery before third party discovery before the discovery period opens. And yet it's another instance of plaintiffs believing that the, the rules don't apply to them. So in some, that's what this motion is about. And it's a it's an unfortunate motion, but it, it's one that is a plaintiff's unwillingness to abide by clear rules is, is starting to cause serious harm to uh, people in this party, uh, this case already before it even gets off the ground. Um, and so you know, at this juncture, what we're asking is going into this next phase of the case. At this juncture, we're asking for a court order that the procedural rules that the parties need to abide by the procedural rules, because whatever uh, their religious beliefs may be, um, belief is not a basis to not follow the rules. Like the plaintiffs need to follow the rules, and so do we. And and that is the purpose of today's motion. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Zorn. Mr. Uh, Noskazi, did I say that correctly? Actually, Your Honor, you, you did uh, in terms of the Italian pronunciation, but oh. uh, the, our pronunciation and our family has changed over the years, and it's no shay. No shay. Uh, All right. Point. Yes, thank well, you. I'm glad Honor. at least I got the Italian pronunciation <laughs> correct. That is uh, correct. Mr. Noshe, what do you have to add to what Mr. Zorn has provided, if anything? Miss uh, Eoff is going to address that, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Eoff, what, what else do you have to add to what Mr. Zorn has just presented? Um, Ms. Mr. Zorn has adequately ex explained what has happened with respect to our clients. We do have a motion on file for to stay discovery because the discovery period has not opened. I can confirm that we explained the rule <laughs> several times to Mr. Lake, and I believe he just had an outdated copy of the rules, and that's why there was some confusion. And so um, we're here. Um, to verify that what Mr. Zorn has correct as far as is correct as far as what's been going on, but this is his motion. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Lake, please unmute yourself and let me hear your views, okay? Yeah, thank you, Judge. Um, and I guess if you don't mind if I start out giving a little bit of our side of the background, you know, leading up to this case and kind of what this case is is about, and All then right. briefly address these local rule alleged violations. Um, we, um, I, I'm an attorney in Texas and another attorney in Texas is a good friend of mine and we are what we would call entheogen based religious practitioners. We claim protection under the, uh, the federal religious, religious freedom and restoration act of 1993 and the first amendment and also the Texas <laughs> freedom and restoration act, uh, I believe of 1999. Uh, which provides commensurate, and if you ask the Fifth Circuit, in some cases, possibly more protection than than the the, the, the federal counterpart. But anyways, we 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 ran across, and my my partner had been on a very long spiritual journey to find a molecule like silomethoxin, um, and he came across a some literature from a, a very respected, uh, but not with us anymore, chemist uh, uh, named uh, um, uh, God, his name, um, uh, Shulgin, Alexander Shulgin. Anyways, Alexander Shulgin proposed if you if you if you put, you know, uh, 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 on a cow patty with. Uh, hallucinogenic psilocybin mushroom substrate growing in it 
five meo DMT, five methyl uh, methyloxyl dimethyltryptamine, which are both these are all all three together are are controlled substances. Silomethoxin is not a controlled substance. Now, now there are residual amounts of psilocybin and psilocin left over in our sacrament. Now. We, when we first began our church uh, way back in 2020, um, we did not immediately open it up to the public. We actually went and served uh, a little bit over 1,200 people um, who all gave the same feedback. No negative health reactions. That was our main concern. And then two, that, they, that there was a absolutely unique effect profile from these mushrooms, from any other mushrooms that these these very experienced people have created. So, in September 2022, we decided we went public with the with the uh, church. Um, despite you know now, yes, it is a lot easier to uh, get sacrament from our church, but that is more or less a function of what has been caused by these defendants. Um, within September through April um, of 2023, we saw significant growth. And I don't know if that upset the USONA defendants or how we came on their radar of, or of any degree, but we had been making strides because part of our, part of my clients, the church's uh, liturgy is this idea that science and religion and spirit are not neatly compartmentalized things and that you know especially through the study of psychedelics we're starting to realize that you know these two things overlap in many ways that we don't quite understand and and so it's part of our religious practice to to further understand the interrelationship between those two types of dichotomies um and so yeah so anyways we were our plan was you know once we get up and running we we get membership in we had about 2000 members whenever this happened we were doing really well we were bringing in almost $100,000 a month in membership fees and 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 uh uh sacrament sales and uh you know, but at that time we had not had enough money to save up to get our own testing facility because, as you can see from what's happened in this case, you can't just go to any willy nilly person and ask for a test, you know, to, to test your stuff and trust that what they're going to come out with is truthful. And what what we found out probably a, about two months before suit was filed here was that if you test our sacrament with water, unlike methanol that USONA Promega did, again, and Matt was right, there this is kind of a, a, a the there is no reference sample currently existing for this this molecule, but USONA did make a guess at what the weight would be. And when we tested our sacrament with water, consistently every time we're pulling up a molecule with that exact same weight and so we are in the process of creating the nmr reference sample to absolutely confirm 100 percent that there is silomethoxin in our sacrament and i will say this before i turn to the just real quick and address the local rules is that I have a billionaire client that is in Nebraska that was invited to USONA Promega facility and was told some things that seemed to indicate that they knew before they published this article that um that um you know that they knew that that this was not the the hundred percent truth. But we will prove that in court. Don't take my word for that. That's just something I'm throwing out there. Um, but with that being said, Look, on the local rules, I've I I did maritime litigation in Louisiana for close to four to five years before I completely switched over to doing this. Um I had never had to single-handedly deal with so many defendants at one time to try to get them served uh in such a short timeline like a like a defamation claim with a one-year statute of limitations. 
Um, I did the best I could. I thought that I was really just following through with my due diligence. Um, you know, with with Mr. Mr. Zorn, I've known Mr. Zorn. Uh, we've had a prior relationship, um, and we are, I consider us to be friends. And um, he just, you know, it kept saying one day, you know, give me a couple more days. We're going to get this. And there's a lot of republishers here. So, you know, his claim to represent all the republishers. But if you ask him one day if he represents Gordo Tech and if I can get instead of having to subpoena, you know, uh, a Patreon to get his anonymous information and 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 if and I'm, I will be filing a motion very soon because I just amended my Second Amendment petition to to basically uh, include sufficient constitutionally sufficient evidence to create a prima facie case against Gordo Tech that would basically give you the green light to give a, uh, a order to compel Patreon to, to, to disclose to me, regardless of when the, the, the discovery period starts, because this is a third party. I'm not even really sure how applicable this new third party rule, and I was mistaken at first, and I do apologize to everyone on the USONA side for being mistaken about the rule. Um, I had an old old version of O'Connor's, and I wasn't aware of the new amendments that had taken place. But now I am very well aware, and 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 you know, ready to proceed that way. <laughs> Lastly, I I do. Unfortunately, this has caused me a lot of stress. My normal work plus taking on this litigation. And I had a couple seizures over the course of about three weeks. And I, I honestly do not remember placing these two phone calls to uh, USONA. My wife tells me that I did did make the one with, with and identified myself as G. Um, you know, why I did that, where I, where I was mentally when I did that, I, I do not know um i apologize it will never happen again as far as the other one is identifying myself as a roderick or roger or something i don't have any record of it my wife does not seem to recall me making that that phone call um but we do she did hear me call them and 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 we and what we were doing were seeking better service information to get them served is what what was what was the the cause of the matter all right very good thank mm -hmm. you mr lake yes ma'am all right so i've heard now from mr zorn with the republisher defendant i've um uh, talked with miss uh eoff who says that she is going to rely on the arguments made by mr zorn at this time i realize there's some other motions but they aren't set today and i've had the opportunity to hear from mr lake who um are you currently licensed in Texas or are you pro se? I am. I'm currently licensed in Texas. And I will say it due to my uh, physical ailments, we have been able to, I think by the end of this week, we'll have a firm out of San Antonio, basically taking lead counsel for us um, in this, because there might be a chance I might have to be a witness. So, you know, right. In case that chance comes, we'll have someone there who can take in and, and, you know, there won't be any issue and we can keep this thing going smoothly. Mr. Lake, I would strongly recommend that. I think it's very difficult mm -hmm. uh, to represent an entity yes. that you have strong uh, beliefs about. It is. Uh, it's hard to keep your emotions out of it. And that can really sometimes not benefit a party in the courtroom. So I would encourage you to get that law firm that you mentioned or any any reputable firm to mm -hmm. help you with the case. So uh, yes. today we have to take what we've got. All right, so Mr. Zora, let's go back to you. So it looks to me like what you're asking me to do is to, um, is to sign an order that says, follow local rules, but you're basically already an order. Um, is is that what you're wanting? I mean, or is it just more the type of thing where you need me to hold them in contempt? I guess that's the question. What do you want from me today? 
Uh, Your Honor, we we do not want an order, a contempt order today. Uh, All to, right. The clip that you know the operative word being today, um, that is not what we want. We we do not want sanctions. We do not want any affirmative punishment today. Um, but we do believe a court order saying that that the parties need to abide by the local rules would be would then be a court order, and then going forward, the parties would need to adhere to the rules on and maybe if, if it continues again a very unusual motion but as i've narrated to the court there have been some serious uh events that that, that frankly just need to stop um, my clients can cannot be contacted by mr lake without going through me um, when he knows them to be represented that that is my main concern at this juncture and so um and, and similarly with the procedural rules um it, it, it can't going forward, it, it can't be the rules don't apply to us. So that that's all we're requesting today is a court order saying that the local rules apply to everyone and going forward, there, there could be contempt penalties. Yeah, well, of course they do apply to everyone. They already apply to everyone. Um, I can't really issue an advisory opinion, you know? Um, well then 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 your honor we would ask that that simply the court notes that the rule rule was violated in this case but um but, but we are not asking for a, a penalty or a sanction of any kind right. um the, the motion was resolved successfully but um but but we would like a finding that the local rule was violated because plaintiffs did not confer on the motion all right so i can't i can't issue an order that says in the future follow the local rules that's already the rule now, what he's saying, Mr. Lake, and when I ask him about contempt, and I, I think Mr. Zorn is trying to keep the, um, he's trying to pour water on this fire rather than gasoline, which I do appreciate very much. I wish that more people would come into court with that attitude. That typically those local rules are they are they already have the force of a court order, and if you violate them, you violate them. And so, if you continue to violate them, they can come in and on a motion for contempt which can include fines and jail time. And I know those are things you don't want because it would take you away from, from the Church of uh, Sacred Synthesis, and that's what you do not want. So, but Mr. Zorn has um, pulled that punch, as they say. He's not gonna do that. Um, I cannot draft, an, I can't sign an order that says in the future, follow the local rules, because that doesn't add anything. It's advisory in nature. Mr. Zorn, if you want to draft an order that says there has been a violation of the local rule, and I find it, the parties are not currently seeking contempt or monetary sanction, I, I would sign an order like that, but be specific on, on how it was violated, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. All right, so I'm going to go on and grant relief to Mr. Zorn today. Mr. Lake, though, please keep in mind, this is, as we used to say, it's a shot over the bow meaning it's kind of a warning. It's a warning volley that's saying to you, you got it. I, I understand what you're saying. You've had some, certainly some very serious health issues, it sounds like to me, and I hope those are resolved. Uh, Duke, I'm concerned about your well-being with that, sir. Uh, I know you have had experience practicing maritime law in Louisiana, as, as you've explained to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you're in the process of looking for a law firm. To handle the case i really suggest you do that because the thing is this mr zorn if he hadn't come in and just fired the shot over the bow could have gotten you he could have made you all pay some attorney's fees i know you want that money for the church and he could have come in here and and held you in some personal contempt and, and that would take you know not only are you a person with some health issues but you're also as you pointed out to me extremely busy with your church and this litigation the last thing you need is for us to impose some sort of jail time for violating local rules. Now, I'm not saying we would do that, but it's in it's in the um, basket of the tool the toolbox that we have for these types of things. So let's take Mr. Zorn at his word. He's going to draft an order saying that there was a violation of the local rules. He's going to explain it in the order. He's going to say that there's no contempt being sought and no attorney's fees. I'm going to sign that. But uh, Mr. Lake, please, please, in the future. Just review those local rules. They're online. They're very easy to find. So just find those Travis County local rules and read them and abide by them. Do not contact people. I know you said you don't remember it, and I'm going to take you at your word on that. But if your wife hears you picking up that telephone when you're in an altered state of mind because of health issues or what have you, 
please, please say the court, the court has ordered me not to do that. You all figure out a way for her to nicely ask you to, to not make that phone call and to wait till your head is cleared. And then I want you to contact these attorneys directly, not the clients. Okay. It, it was my fault, Your Honor. I, um, you know, the statute of limitations was running up real quick. Okay. And I was just impressing upon her how, you know, we need to get this filed and, and served ASAP, like, like just ASAP, ASAP, ASAP. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, even she was kind of getting a little bit frustrated with Mr. Uh, Zorn a little bit whenever he was kind of going back and forth a little bit. And she was like, you know, just follow the, just follow the motion, you know, and, and, and I think we, we all learned a little bit now that, you know, if Mr. Zorn tells me that he's representing somebody, even though they haven't been quite served yet and it's past the statute of limitations, I guess I just got to kind of rely on what he says. Well, the filed and served, I mean, I don't want to tell you how to do your lawsuit, but I think, you know, if you got the filed in a timely fashion and served within a reasonable time, you're probably OK. But I have not looked at the statute that applies to you. So right. you need to get, you know, too wound up on that now. Here's what I'm going to ask you, Mr. Lake. I, yeah. I hear what you're saying. Please, when we get off this call, go online and find the Travis County local rules and read them. In fact, Ms. Guardiola, is it possible for us to put, or Mr. Agitti, possible for us to put a link to those rules in the chat box so that we don't have this come up again? I've, I've got them right. I've been, I was reading them prior to our, our hearing today, Judge. Um, Good. I, I'm going to become an expert on them um, by Good. the litigation. That's what I like to hear. All right, so let's do that. And again, tell your wife, you know, if you start to see me when I'm, I've had one of these, you know, bad health spells with seizures or whatnot, please, please don't let me make those silly phone calls to, to people who are represented. You need to, those calls, all of them now, do you need to go directly to Mr. Zorn or to uh, the other uh, uh, attorneys on this call if it pertains to them? Represented people cannot be contacted directly. That's why we have to have yes. it with the attorneys. Okay. All right. And when you have someone call up and say, hey, can we make an agreement? If you're amenable to that agreement, at which the rules require you to do that first, then that's that's done. That's a done deal. All right. We don't go back on that. So, all right, folks. I don't know if there's anything else I can do for you, Mr. Zorn. Please draft that order. Do not make it advisory in nature. And uh, I will sign it and send it to Mr. Lake. And Mr. Lake, you put that right where your wife can see it. And you say, look, this that judge said this is a shot over the bow. In the future, we are, we've got to be a lot more careful or we could get in, uh, end up having to pay attorney's fees. We could end up being fined. Bad enough violation, we could even end up in jail. And that takes you away from your duties with the church. And that's what you don't want. Okay. The, the attorneys we spoke with, real quick, Judge, the attorneys we, we spoke with real quick yesterday, they were just blessed that we have one judge through this whole thing. They said, they said, look, all you, because I, I like to research and write. I'm a First Amendment expert, and I like to research and write on First Amendment stuff. So, like, all I'm going to be doing from now on is just sitting back, research, writing, doing some depots and some discovery. Mm -hmm. and, and and only talking to the parties with their attorney present. All right, that sounds good. And to the degree that you can take on more of an assistive research role mm -hmm. than being the face of the litigation, in other words, at depositions and things like that, I would really encourage you not to do that. I think when we have to show up as attorneys asking questions in court or in yeah. deposition, because as, as we always say in deposition, it's just as if the judge and jury are right there when that's occurring to the degree that you can step away and hand off those duties to the San Antonio law firm you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think that you're going to find that your time here is a lot easier and that we won't have Mr. Zorn, Mr. Uh, no Sage and, and Ms. Eop bringing you into court on this stuff. So, uh, but I understand it. You're, <clears throat> as you've made very clear, you, um, I have a high degree of expertise in these areas, and I have no doubt that you will be research and writing. I just kind of let that law firm take the lead in court and, and any kind of witness or deposition. OK, um, the other thing, Mr. Lake, I want you to be aware. Um, it looks like there is going to be a motion filed potentially uh, by Mr. Zorn uh, kind of questioning the underpinning of this lawsuit. That's something he's entitled to do. 
The other thing I want you to be aware of is you, you might get some disclosure requirements. Please look at the, excuse me, Texas Rules of Civil Procedure on Disclosures. Okay. If you get discovery coming in, please look at those discovery rules. Now, sometimes in discovery, they ask us to turn over things that we do not want to turn over. The law still requires you to get those at least to your attorney. Make sure that no matter what happens, that you that you put a number at the bottom of every single page sequentially from the first page all the way through to page 1000. We Great. used to call them Bates numbers, but we don't call them. They're just numbers, sequential numbers. And that when you respond to that discovery, that you write in response, for instance, C page numbers 0005 through 00025. Okay. If you do that, it'll make things a whole lot easier. If you just, you know, I have a big pile of, of cases on my desk, but if this were a batch of discovery and I just took all this in an envelope and sent it to them, that's too hard to deal with. And that's not what the rules require. So on the bottom of each page, put it in your Adobe program, it'll put a number on it. And then when you respond to those questions, make sure to put that number in there. Now, when we hang up this call, thank you for looking at the Travis County local rules. Go look at the look at the rules on this on disclosures, requests for production, and interrogatories and depositions. Familiarize yourself with those. If for some reason the San Antonio firm does come in, you'll have more productive discussions with them. Mm -hmm. If they don't come in, then we hopefully won't end up here again on a motion that honestly we didn't really need to come in. Okay. Uh, All right, Mr. Lake. 99 percent they'll be coming in so we'll okay. hopefully by the end of this week next week have them uh as counsel and we can just okay make an have a make an appearance so i can see them when they come in i will all right very good all right mr uh zorn anything else uh no your honor thank you very much we, we appreciate the hearing from you. you're welcome mr uh no sage any, anything else Nothing uh, from us, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. EF, Ms. EF, anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you for your time. All right. You're welcome. All right. Thank you all. It's good to see all of you. I wish you a very happy rest of the day, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future. Uh, you Thanks, may God. be excused, okay? It's been a Thank pleasure you. seeing you all today. Thank you all. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's Judge Laurie Iserlow here on an absolutely gorgeous day in downtown Austin, Texas, at our Civil and Family Courts facility. We have several cases on the afternoon docket, all of which uh, have um, opted for our Zoom uh, court option, which is great. Saves you time and money and keeps the air pressure. So these are all great things. Uh, we are going to start today with our First case, which is GN24001696. This is uh, Adam McKay, Director of Sacred Sciences of the Church of the Sacred Synthesis at all versus Alexander Sherwood at all. Okay, may I please have announcements by the movement and then by the respondent? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jordan Curry from Munch Heart. I'm joined by Greg Noche from Munch Heart and Beth Kushner from the Wisconsin firm of Ron Breeson and Roper, and we represent the USONA Promega defendants. All right, USONA Promega. Okay. Who else is here? And the respondent uh, on behalf of the plaintiffs, Thomas Kamak from the Harper Law Firm out of San Antonio. Hello, Mr. Kamak. Okay. Hey, Judge. Um, your Honor, this is Matthew Zorn uh, for the Republisher Defendants, and that's the last thing I'm going to say at this hearing because I'm here with my colleague Sam Rossum, who is a younger lawyer, and will be taking the proceedings for our our clients today. All right, very good, Mr. Rossum. I'm going to give you some kind feedback that with that light behind you, I can only see your face in darkness. So thank you. Oh, you, should, I'll, I'll, you don't I'll need do to fix rotation. it now. I'm just telling you for future reference, since you're a young lawyer, you might want to watch that. The window goes in front of your face, not behind your head, because it's it. more effective when I can see you. All right. Very good. But I'm thrilled that you're here. Welcome to the 455th Civil District Court. All right. Uh, Ms. Curry, do you wish to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. And um, I'd like to share my screen uh, to show a um, PowerPoint slide. All right. That's acceptable. Yes. Okay, I should be sharing now. I can see it. All right. 
Excellent. So uh, like I said, Jordan Curry from Munch Heart on behalf of the USONA ProMega defendants. And um, we should have a very quick presentation this afternoon, uh, but I wanted to give you uh, sort of a refresher on this case. It's been a, a minute since we've been before your honor. Mm -hmm. uh, we are here today on the defendant's request for uh, attorney's fees incurred in defending this case. Uh, if you'll recall, this is a case brought by a church and its members against a research institution and members of the media based on an article um, that was published by the researchers that discussed a study that they had done on the church's sacrament. We were before your honor in June of this year on the defendant's motion to dismiss under the Texas Citizens Participation Act, the TCPA. Right. And July 22nd, your honor granted those motions and dismissed the case with prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, and as we've sort of touched on so far today, there are three firms representing the defendants. You've got Munch Hart um, and Von Breesen on behalf of the USONA Promega defendants, and then Yetter Coleman on behalf of the Republisher defendants, who are those people who were named in the lawsuit based on their sharing or republishing of, of the article at issue. Mm -hmm. So before I get into the substance, we do want to... Um, draw your attention to the exhibits that we submitted in connection with our briefs and and uploaded to the court's Dropbox earlier this week. Okay. It's um, three attorney declarations and three copies of fee statements, and we do uh, want to admit those um, now since we will be referring to those. What is the What are the exhibit numbers on those? It's USONA 001 through 004 and Republisher 001 and 002. Any objection to those exhibits? Uh, no objection at this time, Your Honor. All right. They are all admitted. Please proceed. So um, for starters, the legal standard here, uh, the TCEPA has a pretty clear one, which is that the court must award uh, attorney's fees to uh, and costs to a prevailing TCPA movement. And the rationale is that the TCPA uh, mitigates against an especially uh, a dangerous type of lawsuit, which are the types of lawsuits that stifle free speech and public participation. And so the mandatory fee shifting gives the TCPA its teeth, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I do want to note also that the fee uh, award, it, it, it includes all fees incurred in defending the entire legal action and not just the fees incurred in bringing the TCPA motion itself. So that's something um, that we bore in mind when we when we filed our motions. In awarding the fees under the TCPA, and I hope that my slides are moving along with me. Um, I'm should be here on slide four with a yeah this one says Rormus venture lodestar method reasonable hour work times reasonable hourly hourly rate equals lodestar figure that's what the slide says so. excellent so in awarding the fees under the TCPA courts do use the lodestar method which the court is is familiar with I'm sure and it was articulated most recently in by the Supreme Court in Rormus venture. And you calculate the load star by applying the reasonable number of hours worked times the reasonable hourly rate, and it supplies you with the load star figure. And attorneys' fees movements um, meet their burden by supplying evidence of services performed, who performed them, and when, and the amount of time required for the services. And the defendants uh, did that um, in the fee statements we've got from Munch Hart, Von Briesen, and Yetter Coleman, they identify the specific tasks in the form of their narratives, the specific tasks that the attorneys performed, who performed them, uh, when they were performed, and the amount of time that was spent on them. We also have attorney expert uh, testimony by uh, Mr. Noche, Ms. Kushner, and Mr. Zorn about some of the tasks that the uh, firms had to take on in defending the action. And then we've also got attorney testimony that the fees incurred and reflected in the statements are reasonable and were necessary. Um, and so the lodestar figure that we've arrived at based on the evidence submitted and the, and the calculation here very straightforward is Munch Hart, um, the USONA Promega defendants incurred from Munch Hart, $87,437 in fees from Bra Von Briesen, $47,491 in fees, and the republisher defendants from Yetter Coleman, uh, incurred $97,596.37 in fees. 
And so because we've submitted the evidence that's required of us, competent declaration supported by fee statements, the Lodestar is presumptively reasonable. And I'll note that uh, you might have noticed as well, the plaintiffs don't appear to dispute the reasonableness of the rates or the hours because they failed to respond to the, to the uh, motions at all, let alone uh, put forward controverting evidence of, of our uh, competent evidence on fees. Um, and I do want to shed some light um, and sort of refresh the court's recollection about some factors that impacted the cost of litigation and caused this uh, matter to be a little bit more costly and time consuming. Um, I'll just note that in three months time, we had four petitions, each of them more voluminous than the last and the most recent one, the third amended petition coming in on the eve of the hearing for on the TCPA motions accompanied by hundreds of pages of exhibits and a brand new expert affidavit the defendants had never seen before. Um, additionally, as the court probably recalls, we were before your honor in May of this year on a motion to enforce the local after the plaintiffs had um, directly communicated with represented parties, um, misrepresented in certificate of conferences, uh, their conferences with defense counsel, um, use deception in order to get information from the parties and and your honor agreed with defendants that these uh these things violated the local rules and our motion was, was ultimately granted and so um these are some of the tactics that we were were dealing with that that made this case uh, more time consuming we also had to uh overcome and defeat de plaintiffs broad overarching discovery requests, which the court also agreed with us at that time was improper for the phase of the litigation that we were in. And we bring these issues up now because um, plaintiffs, you know, dilatory and sometimes contumacious tactics referenced in the attorney declarations and here on the slide, they help explain the amount of attorney time expended in this case. And so, um, just a few more points to make here. We are also requesting our contingent appellate fees, which are also mandatory under the statute, uh, the fee, sh fee shifting. Um, and plaintiffs have uh, certainly indicated their intent to appeal this matter as they have filed a notice of appeal, whether it's um, premature or not is a, a different issue, but they've certainly um, intent, uh, demonstrated their intent to appeal your, your honor's orders. And so on the contingent appellate fees uh, issue, courts rather than the Lodestar method rely just on attorney expert testimony in awarding those fees. Uh, the attorney declarants here, Mr. Noche, Ms. Kushner, and Mr. Zorn have testified that their respective firms will handle the appeal of this matter and that based on their experience, they've estimated the reasonable uh, appellate attorney's fees, which comprise uh, uh, research, brief writing, uh, preparation for oral argument and all the other necessary tasks for litigating an appeal in, in the state of Texas. And they arrived at these figures based on their experience litigating appeals, including in the state of Texas. And so um, we uh, referenced those estimates in our, our papers and in the attorney declarations and in the proposed order. So I won't I won't list them out here uh, now, but might as well just say them. I'm I'm feeling like your fees are pretty high here, Ms. Curry. Honestly, so you might as well tell me what is it that you're seeking on appeal. Go ahead. Sure. So Give me the bad news. Sure. Uh, <laughs> the Usona Promega defendants, uh, Mr. Noche estimates that a cost of defending an appeal in the Court of Appeals uh, would cost uh, eighty thousand dollars plus seventy five hundred dollars in costs. Uh, for Munch Hart, a uh, petition for cert to the Supreme Court would cost $30,000. And then merits uh, briefing and argument in the Supreme Court would be another $60,000 plus $7,500 in costs. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kushner, whose firm would assist in the uh, appeal of the matter, um, being the um, our, you know, resident expert on defending the research institutions, has testified that defending an appeal in the Court of Appeals would cost via von Briesen $40,000, a petition for cert $20,000, and merits briefing in the Supreme Court $30,000. And then Yetter Coleman, um, which Mr. Rossum, I'm sure, will speak more about um, if necessary. As Mr. Zorn has testified that the defending the appeal in the Court of Appeals would cost $60,150, a cert petition would cost $32,000. 
and a merits briefing and argument in the Supreme Court would cost $92,000. Wow. I'll tell you, we've had a Texas Citizens Participation Act case, which honestly seemed more complex than this one, but these were a lot lower and the attorneys were fancier, but that's just my view. You know, there's a saying, what is it? Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. You know, this is a lot of money, folks. Um, I'm not I'm not particularly happy with what you all are coming to me on. We've tried to do this as efficiently as possible for you. And I feel like this is this is it's an overreach taking advantage. So that's just me. But I haven't ruled on it yet. But I'm just telling you, you might want to sharpen those pencils a bit. All right. Go ahead, Miss Curry. So we've also um, got a. Uh, nominal costs that were incurred via the law firms as shown on the slide. Um, I am wrapping up and, you know, just to sum up, the defendants are requesting the the reasonable and necessary fees that, that they've incurred um, and the costs in defending this action, which the statute does require. Uh, the defendants have put forth competent declarations uh, supported by true and correct uh, fee statements, and the plaintiffs have filed no opposition, let alone controverting evidence. And so we would submit that the court should award the Lodestar fee. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Ms. Curry. All right, Mr. Kamek, you didn't file a response. What's up with that deal? Uh, Your Honor, there was kind of some back and forth where originally I was not even CC'd on some of the hearings. So you know, uh, a lot of what they're claiming that they had charges for are completely unrelated to the anti-slap and when they were dealing with the pro se plaintiff. Are uh, we on? Are we with the court reporter? We are. So you need to slow down so my court reporter can write down everything you're saying. Understand. Why don't you have a response on file? That's what I'm asking you. I, I understand, Your Honor. Um, so the reality is, is I was not timely notified of the hearing by opposing counsel. I was in trial and out of town for the death of my grandmother. So that was those were two things that had happened when they finally decided to notice me and they did not, they sent it to the client as opposed to me. Um, so I do apologize for not having a response on file, but I do have Who wants to Stop. Who wants to speak to that? He's saying he didn't get notice. I eventually did. Okay. When did you get notice? Uh, I can pull that up, Your Honor. Um, but they had, they essentially said, well, We've sent it to your client, so why would we need to include you? And I had. When did you get notice? That's my question. And yes, I'm sir. not trying to be. A, I'm really not trying to be difficult. It's just these big firms, whom have really lost my trust, quite honestly, with this very grabby fee structure. They should know better. But I don't have anything else in the file because you didn't file anything. So when did when did you receive notice, sir? And your honor, that's what I'm. When? Trying to, I'm trying to look that up, your honor. Uh, it looks like, it looks like it might've been Friday the 4th. Okay. So we are now here on October the 17th. So there right. has been time for you to file some sort of response to this and you didn't. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. I don't know what we do about that problem. All right. Finish your argument as best you can without a response on file. Uh, I, I mean, I think uh, first and foremost, there's some common law claims that are not subject to the anti-slap that they're just not entitled to the fees related to. Um, there's a lot of their work is cumulative. They're, they're, I do not think their hourly rate is reasonable. I mean, I've tried two week trials and not had fee rates at this rate. Uh, I think there's some overbilling and, and duplicative. Um, and so I don't think they can say, hey, look, we had a fight with the pro se plaintiff over this, or we're alleging dilatory tactics, or we had to get a protective order, or do all these other matters unrelated to the anti-slap, where there's no casual connection between the work done and the anti-slap motion itself, and claim that they, in fact, can can charge for that. Um, I, I also, I, I, again, I don't think there's a mandatory fee award for things that are common law claims, such as the fraud claims he brought, that wouldn't have been subject to the anti-slap motion. All right, let me hear from you, Miss Curry, on the fraud claims. What's up with that? So he's saying, look, you all have billed for fraud, but those aren't anti-slap. So why should I give you money for that? Tell me your response, please. Your Honor, we moved for dismissal and received dismissal on all claims in the petition on under the anti-slap statute. And when we were before you arguing the, the TCPA motion um, over the summer, we we did not hear any argument, nor was there any in the papers, that some of these claims weren't subject to the TCPA. Fact is that the case was dismissed uh, pursuant to TCPA motions, and that included all claims and all with prejudice. 
All right, folks, I don't know what to do about you. I really don't. I mean, you know, the Church of the Sacred Synthesis may not be everybody's cup of tea, but they are apparently some sort of church. So, and they're, they're folks who've shown up in my courtroom, and I find them to be sincere. So what you're asking me to do is to award buku appellate fees and what, 232000 some odd dollars in fees against these people. And and we got no response on file from Mr. Kamek. So, yeah, although he's had notice for since October the 4th. So I'm not prepared to rule on this right now. I'm going to have to give this some thought. But, folks, I am I am not happy. Defense firms, I feel like you're being grabby, Mr. Kamek. There's no excuse for you not having followed the response here. Understood. So with that, I'm going to let you all go for the day. But I'm telling you, I have seen these people in my courtroom with this Church of the Sacred Synthesis, and I do find them to be sincere. Now, without a response on file, it does it does tie my hands just a bit, Mr. Kamek. Um, but wow. You know, the thing is, folks, you come back through my court all the time. I'm going to see you again. I'm going to see these firms again. And I'm going to remember this that we had, you know, some folks, they may not be everybody's cup of tea. We may not all believe what they believe, but they do have, they are authentic in their belief and you're going to come after them with this degree of fees. Come on. I don't, I'm not, I'm not understanding where you're coming from on that deal. Okay. All right. I need you all to please be excused. I'm going to have to give this some thought uh, before I rule. Um, thank you. You may be excused for the day. Let's go to the next case. Thank you.